When I first started these podcasts, one of the people I knew that I wanted to talk to was Meg Shadell. Uh, she works at uh, University of New York in Stony Brook, um, but she's also one of the people that was part of the New York crew that I'd gotten to know over the years. And um, I had actually worked with her at Cycling 74 for a while. She uh, always brought an amazing energy and enthusiasm to everything that she did. She's also um, very active in the audio and visual world, so it's kind of interesting to talk to somebody that plays in uh, both sides of that media game. And so I wanted to uh, spend a little time talking to her, find out how she integrates the two pieces, how she works with different kinds of technology, and um, how she sees herself fitting in the audio media world. Here you go. All right, Meg, uh, it's good to have you on our podcast today. Um, I'd like to dive right into uh, your musical life. Uh, from reading your uh, your CV and, and the information that you have on the web on shadell.net, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, it's a, a pretty impressive uh, body of work. You do a lot of performance work. You do uh, a lot of uh, composition. And uh, one of the things I notice when you read that, you uh, kind of get a sense of a person who has a background in sort of like the classical uh, paradigm. You're, you self-identify as a composer. You play an instrument that has a long history of use in classical music. Um, but your use of these classical devices really kind of belies the actual work that you do. You're, you're heavily involved in electronic music development. Um, your use of the cello is electrified. It's software extended. You use the cable. And uh, you really redefine the instrument in a lot of ways. How, do you, how did you manage that transition? Um, I... I wouldn't even call it a transition. Um, my father's a computer programmer and I took piano lessons from about the age of six because I had small motor control problems. Um, and then when I was in sixth grade, my parents bought an Apple computer and my father read about this magical thing called MIDI um, and bought me a keyboard and a MIDI interface one summer, one uh, year for Christmas, I think, or my birthday. And I just never looked back. So I actually have an undergraduate degree in computer music. So it's been a part of me for almost as long as I've been doing music. So then what caused you to choose cello as the instrument? Uh, my piano teacher, ironically, um, thought that I should develop my ear. Um, and when I started cello, I was just like, what? I can change the sound after I've started it and I can do all this stuff. Um, and to me, when I found the computer, it was like, wait, I can take this sound and do even more stuff to it. So I think I've always had a fascination with timbre and it was just getting the tools. Sure. Now, it's kind of interesting that, that uh, your father's being a computer programmer had uh, some influence on you because I find that a lot of times people uh, that work in the media arts or in sort of experimental music have a lot of trouble explaining to their parents what it is that they do for a living. I mean, they're always most happy when, you, when you're able to say something like, I'm a teacher because that they can wrap their heads around. Well, they're, they're much happier now that I'm a professor. Um, and it's kind of horrifying because my mom was an elementary school teacher and my father was a computer programmer and I spend most of my days teaching computers now. So, <laughs> so it um, makes, makes more sense to them, huh? Makes a little bit of sense to them. And they, they come to my performances um, and they sort of, they mostly get what I do, maybe not why, but they, they understand what's going on. That's great. That's great. So, um, you're uh, currently a professor at Stony Brook, right? That is correct. And what classes are you teaching there? So I have a dual appointment. I am um, half in the music department and half in this consortium for digital art, culture, and technology. So um, when I applied for the job, it was pretty much, wait, so you went to conservatories and you got good grades 
and you got into good schools, but you do this really weird stuff. <laughs> huh. So um, I actually do teach traditional theory and history, and then half of the time I'm doing uh, digital media courses. So I actually um, developed a course called Sound Design um, because we didn't have any courses that people that didn't know how to read music could take. Uh, and I felt like that was something important, especially at a state school where we're serving some populations that didn't have those opportunities. So it's been a really popular class, and I'm really proud of it. That's really interesting because I teach in a uh, in an art department, mm. and um, it's very similar. They want uh, I teach a class called Sonic Arts. They want uh, people to get involved in sound design, but there's not that history of sort of like music, uh, the music process. So you have to kind of explain what octaves are and, and what a scale might be. And yeah. people can get it because they have a history with uh, with listening to music, but a lot of times uh, it's really sad because uh, like within public education, there's very little access to music at this point. Yeah. My friend um, from like second grade on, Margaret Ann Schaefer, uh, is teaching high school band at our old high school. And it's one of the few places that still has a really active music program. Like she even teaches theory. Uh, well, good luck to her because then uh, my, I have kids there in school right now and band is something that they get to do once every two weeks, oh, which is really depressing. It's not banned. <laughs> right. It's not banned if, if that's all that you get out of it. Right. So what kind of uh, what kind of things do you in teaching sort of like sound design, the sonic wonderland to people who aren't who might not have that background with music? What are the things that you find you really have to plumb into in some detail that you otherwise might not? The thing that I mean, I have this certificate in deep listening, um, which just means sort of actually paying deep attention to the sound itself so a lot of them get sort of seduced by the surface and then i'm just like no you need, you need to listen beyond that um and it's really um, amazing to me because some people that have like a little bit of musical training will come in and they'll be all good and then we hit a certain point and the kids that never had musical training but actually listen to me go further so um, it's all about getting them to trust their ears and really know how to listen. Uh, the deep listening thing, is that the thing uh, Pauline Oliveros does? That is the thing that Pauline Oliveros does. Um, can you explain it a little bit? Because I've heard of it, but I can't say I, I know a lot about it, and I should know more about it. But Yeah, so it's, it's a sonic meditation practice um, where... Um, sort of, uh, I can describe the retreats that we went on. Um, you wake up in the morning and you're not allowed to speak in words. You can make sounds. So at breakfast, you can you know, go woo if you need some milk. But the idea is to sort of stop thinking um, in words. Um, there's some Tai Chi and movement exercises. Um, then we do a listening meditation. So you sit um, and just listen and I had tried meditating for a long time because I'm kind of a spaz if you know me thought it would be good for me and I wasn't able to I just got super in my own head and it didn't work um, and deep listening works for me because it's all about just sitting there and listening and trying not to identify the sound so you're not like oh that was a squirrel that right. was a plane um, but just accepting the sounds um, and even if it's your own voice in your head saying, what am I doing? What's going on? She calls it the monkey. Um, you just listen to the monkey. And before I'd been trying to shut the monkey up. Um, and now if you just sort of pay attention to the monkey, eventually the monkey dies away. So I, um, teach a deep listening class to freshmen. And I always try to incorporate some of that into the, um, sonic, um, classes that I run just to really get them into the habit of accepting the whole sonic environment. That's really interesting because I, I too am a spaz and I too have tried meditation and it has also not worked particularly well, mainly because I end up 
uh, with some frustration about not actually accomplishing anything <laughs> while I'm meditating, which is the <laughs> point, I know, but um, it actually seems like having sort of the, having there be a purpose of saying, you know, I'm listening, yeah. that actually would, would make meditation a lot easier for someone like me to be able to approach. That's, that's really interesting. Now, how do you find that that actually affects like the process that you have uh, in your in your own compositional work? So it was actually Mara Helmuth, my teacher um, at University of Cincinnati, where I got my doctorate, who went on one of these retreats and just was like, oh, my God, this changed my life. Um, my musical vocabulary has just been expanded by this. Um, and it, it's fun. And it, besides, like it's this beautiful mountain in New Mexico and you just camp and it's, it's just great. Uh, so um, Pauline came to a uh, workshop in art and technology that I was uh, part of at the kitchen and we did some of her sonic meditations and then she improvised on the accordion an exact sort of microcosm of this sonic meditation. Um, and so that experience, plus my teacher saying how it changed her life, um, made me want to go. Um, I don't know whether I can sort of say anything concrete about what it's done other than like ridiculously broad terms such as opening me and broadening me. Um, but I don't think I would be the composer I am today if not for that experience. Sure. Um, your, your composing technique, do you, uh, are you sort of a traditionalist? Do you like scratch everything out on paper? Do you tend to more uh, use improvisational techniques? What's sort of the process that you go through in, in doing compositional work? Every piece for me is really different. Um, I, I definitely like to write for a specific person. Um, so recently I had a violin student who had taken my computer music class. She was amazing violin. She won the concerto competition here. Uh, and then she needed at Stony Brook, you need to have some 20th century repertoire. And she was just like, I'm not comfortable with 20th century music. I would want to study it for five years before I even tried to perform this stuff. Sure. She loved taking your class. I loved those kind of sounds. So do you think you could write me a piece that I would feel comfortable playing that would have electronics? Um, and I just came up with this idea to write this sort of Bach partita inspired work using um, this recursive uh, stretching idea. So I love what happens when you sort of push effects to their maximum and you get these glitches and warbles and bubbles right. um, and so I was like it would be really cool if you could stretch a sound but keep stretching the stretched sound for as long as you want so instead of just it's going to double the length of your note it'll keep going for as long as you will let it sure okay right? so um, it's three movements each of the movements sort of has a different pitch point at which below that stretching takes place and then, so the first movement actually has two lines, and at any point you can jump down to the notes that will start the new pedal point if it's getting too glitchy for you. Okay. Um, and it was really amazing to me because, I like Bach, I didn't put any bowings or notations in because I really wanted that sort of idea. And it was the first piece I've ever had where, like, just sight reading it, she got it. Oh, wow. That's, that's um, incredible. And then we had to work a bit on the electronics and how to control them, but just working in a, another idiom was very interesting to me. So that was very prescribed. Listen to the Bach, right? right? Music. Um, right. Other times I'll do improvis improvisation. I'm in a uh, composing duo, which people really don't understand, called Kite String with uh, Sarah O'Halloran. And a lot of times we just will improvise. We She's also did deep listening um, retreats. Um, part of the deep listening retreat is also trying to listen in your dreams. So we'll start from this like dream scape and then try to add sounds to that. Oh, that's, so, that's really interesting. 
So there's another case though where it, where it sort of like is at least influential. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. um, speaking of electronics and sort of the uh, the way that especially sort the the bleeding edge of electronics can provide some interesting results. Um, what you you work with a lot of different technology. Um, yeah. You know, over the over the years, you I know you've you've been uh, involved in a lot of different kind of tech. How do you make the decision of what to use when? Wow. Um, that's a really hard question. I mean, because how do I decide? Like, to me, it's more how do I decide to learn a technology, right? Because once I learned it and I know what it can do, it's easy to make the decisions. But to decide what to learn is, when, when to take on something new yeah well, and it's it's getting frustrating as i get older because i'm not as fast as i used to be and i have all these students that are just like oh i'm just gonna try this stuff and i'm like oh i remember when i just was like that and now i'm like do i have the time will it <laughs> impact my you know efficacy on something else gosh um so uh well, I'm really curious about extending that that part of the conversation, though, because one of the things that that I sometimes worry about, and I see it with students, and I see it with people trying, you know, certainly to learn Max or whatever, that um, trying to do sort of like the quick jump in, do something fantastic, and then move to the next shiny object, yeah. really prevents people from getting uh, getting real depth into any of the tools. But on the other hand, some of the some of the variety of tools that that come along are so impressive or are such incredibly shiny objects <laughs> that it's really hard to ignore them. Yeah. And um, trying to figure out a balance there seems pretty difficult as well. I mean, to give a really perfectly concrete example, I, I consider myself pretty expert in Max MSP and jitter-ish. If someone else gives me the visuals, I can manipulate them. I'm not so good with it as um, sort of an array storage uh, device uh, right. that other people I think are brilliant at doing, but I, I can hack in visual land. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty good with Ableton Live and I do not feel at all competent in Max for live yet. Oh, sure. Sure. Because there are just enough different constructs in there. Different constructs. And I want to be able to understand it fully rather than just knowing if I do this, it's fine. (laughs) Right. Well, but yeah, that's a, that's a real interesting point. And I think that that's a difficulty a lot of people deal with, especially it, it almost sometimes is easier to take on a technology that's completely unlike everything just because you don't have these preconceived notions of how they should work. That's why I love working with video. <laughs> well, um, I don't have 10 teachers in my head saying, uh, really? yeah. Wait, <laughs> uh, well, uh, cause I was going to ask, how do you balance, uh, sort of like the, the two pursuits and the two the, the different paradigms that come between working on visuals and working with music. I mean, they, they do seem, uh, at least in, in my work, they seem to be sort of like different disciplines in a very serious way. Um, I guess for me, because I always get raw footage from other people, it just becomes like a sample that I can manipulate. So I don't think of them as very different at all. Um, I have a little bit of synesthesia and I'm, I'm good. Like I can arrange furniture, but I can't make furniture. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm very good at like putting things together, um, but not actually designing them myself. So I, I actually feel a, a big connection between the two. So who are some of the people that you've collaborated with with video work? Yeah, um, one of the big people uh, is Nick Foxgeek, and my collaborations with him have been really interesting um, because we'll take turns being the boss. So collaboration, as much as you want to say when two people are working together, you're incredibly equal and you should just make your decisions. and It doesn't work. Somebody needs to be in charge. So we actually... Um, Rotate who's in charge. 
So some days I will be like, I need this kind of visuals. And no, Nick, can we make her look even crazier? And other times he'll be in charge and he'll be like, hey, can you make that sound just, you know, can you deepen it? Um, and so we've had a really, really good working relationship for almost 20 years now. Wow, that's that's incredible. You know, it's that actually reminds me a lot. I I do work with this with a dance company, and uh, I work really closely with the choreographer. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of times how that interaction works, especially on things that are going to impact both what I'm doing with visuals and what she's going to do with with the choreography. We do that collaboration on the music end, and there is sort of this back and forth of. Who's going to make the decision? Sometimes it's really useful to be the decision maker. Sometimes it's really useful to be the decision receiver. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a that's a real interesting uh, way to think of it. That's that's cool. Yeah, something you might like. Um, when we were living in the same city, we actually had a duo called um, In Strange Paradox, where he was getting into doing live visuals. Um, using a Wacom tablet. So we did these improvised sets where I was in charge of, you know, generating some sound and I had the cabo. Right. My cabo was affecting his images as he was drawing and his Wacom pen was influencing the sound as I was playing. So you not only had to play or draw, you had to be aware of what you were doing to the other medium and also react to what the other person was doing to you. That's, that's, well, I was going to say that's awesome, but my kids have been filling my head with the word awesome. So I have to find a different word. That's incredible. Uh, we'll, we'll say that. Um, that kind of feedback uh, seems to be a part of, at least for me, the, the kind of live art, work that I see or the live performance work that I see so often has these built-in feedback mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, do you find yourself gravitating towards those whenever you can? Yeah, for sure. Um, I really, I don't know why um, I'm obsessed with sort of trying to create these linkages either between people or between people and computers, but I just, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I just like it. I just like it. <laughs> Might be because I have problems making connections with people in real life. <laughs> well, we don't talk about interpersonal we'll problems, though. So. <laughs> we'll keep that to ourselves. <laughs> right. um, now, one other thing that uh, I know that you're really active in is uh, in, in sort of being at the forefront about talking about women's inclusion in uh, media art, in music production, in music uh, development, those kinds of things. Uh, I think you're involved in several organizations that are that have that as kind of a specific uh, desired influence. Is that fair um, to say? I was involved with at least one, the um, Women's Audio Mission back in San Francisco. Um, and I'm on the very edges of this uh, code liberation project that my friend uh, Phoenix Perry started. Um, but I'm not really interested so much in organizations that are for women. I want to just make sure there are women in places to be where they will be seen. So rather than fo focusing on women's organizations, you want to get women involved in the organizations. Yes. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. What are the barriers that you find that kind of prevent that from happening? Um, so I grew up in a town with a lot. We were right near Bell Labs, and um, there were a lot of female engineers um, around this place in New Jersey. Um, so I never actually experienced any kind of sexism that women can't do math or anything. I went to... Goucher College, which before, I think four years before I got there, had become co-ed. And a second year math class, I was the only woman. And I was just like, this is weird. Um, my, I have that undergrad degree in computer music. I would sometimes be the only woman in my computer music classes. And 
I had a composition teacher uh, who would actually make fun of the men in my, it was a group composition class, and he would make fun of the men in the class because I was doing better than they were, and he would be like, this is ridiculous, this woman is doing better than you. And I was like, what? Um, three years in, I went, um, I was sort of going to Peabody at the same time I was going to Goucher because I finished everything at Goucher, and I got invited to help out with um, this wheelchair dance piece uh, that we performed presented at uh, ICMC in Banff, Canada. And I was involved with the programming a bit, um, sound design, everything. Um, But there were 10 men from Peabody that also went to this conference and they got grilled about how the piece worked, how it had these wireless sensors. It was really ahead of its time. Uh, We were working with the Hopkins uh, physics lab. Sure. So, um, and no one asked me a damn thing. Well, they asked me who I was there with and who my husband was. And I, I, I mean, I was 20 at the time. <laughs> oh, my. So it was sort of a shock to me because I never had identified even myself as female or what I was doing as particularly male. Um, and it was jarring, to say the least, to sort of be confronted with my own gender. <laughs> Do you think that that attitude has changed much in the intervening years? Um, I don't run into that many people who are like me and aren't thinking of themselves in terms of gender. Like we have such a gendered society. I have like crazy, ridiculous, overprotective parents who would only let me watch one hour of public television a week. So I wasn't exposed to stuff. Um, And I think I don't want to raise my kid that way if I have one. Um, But I do think that a lot of media and society sort of pressures kids one way or the other um, to the point that if you ask a student his or her gender before a math test, the women's scores drop. Interesting. So it's this subtle thing, um, and there's a lot of people studying it, particularly in um, the sciences, the STEM fields because they want to have more women and it's it's very funny to me because i have two cousins who are engineers another who's a pilot these are all females so my i think both sides of my family have these strong women who don't care um but all of us are sort of like why aren't there more this is weird um and they've actually done studies and the main thing that they can find is that if you see other people who are like yourself. So if you see a woman doing something, you're more likely to think you can do it. So that's pretty much why I'm just like, Hey, put a woman on it. (laughs) That's actually interesting because, um, one of the things I was actually, as you were talking, I was, I was wondering if you thought that there was that, that some of this push, whether it's through the STEM thing or whatever, where it's sort of like, we have to get women, uh, to, do better at math that that doesn't sort of like ghettoize women who already do math you know but it, i do see where uh where having people visibly in uh, visibly in that environment makes a huge difference yeah i mean and it's harder to think i mean i'm not even advocating for 50 50 balanced programs but and and it cause and I know that I've had some opportunities presented to me just because I'm a woman but I take them and I run with them um I've gotten to the point of saying now do you want me just because I have a vagina because I also have seven friends who could do this who also have vaginas uh, people will be like oh there are more people I'm like yes I have a whole binder full of them and I literally <laughs> now have a list of 100 100- emails when people are like i couldn't think of anybody i'm like here you go i I send the list with like they're a composer they're a researcher they're a performer this is what they've done and i will send it out like you you think there's not a woman here you go and i really um kind of want to get now into doing that for minorities as well and it is a little bit annoying you know you're the token woman or you're the token minority but you being there could change the course of someone in the audience's life Yeah, I think that's a great point because I I think that so often those kind of influences are not the ones that people come rushing up after a performance or after a speaking engagement. They don't come run up and say, you changed my life, you know. No, it's subtle. 
Right, but yeah, I I get that. That's cool. What do you think? There's any other things that need to uh, change in order to make like electronic music or media art or interactive video become a a better environment or or an environment that that is more easily seen as not gendered. I mean, <laughs> I'm hoping maybe these um, MOOCs, these these distributed classes where you sort of can take it in the shelter of your own home are going to be useful. Um, it's really funny. My Kindle is sitting right here and the, the Virginia Wolf picture is up and she's the... Um, you know, back in the day, it was very hard to become a painter or a musician because you needed to intern with somebody. And she was like, all you need to become a writer is to have a, a pen and some paper in a room of your own. Um, and I'm thinking that the computer is starting to become that room of one's own. Um, so just trying to put tools out there so that you can maybe experiment in your home and get some confidence before going out into the world. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That that does seem to be well because it's a it's there's sort of like a screen between the class and yourself. It means that you can be whoever you are. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, <clears throat> when I think about you, I tend to think of you as sort of like in my mind. You know, I live in Denver up in the mountains, so what do I know? But I think I tend to think of you as one of the quote New York people, right? Oh, cool. <laughs> I know. But maybe <laughs> some of it is because like every time I run in into you, it's sort of like, you know, you're there and Luke Dubois is there and Todd Reynolds is there and you know, all my New York people, right? Awesome. You um, know that Reynolds went to Stony Brook. Did he really? Yeah. I didn't know that at all. We're gonna have him out for like an alumni concert, hopefully in November if the dates work out. Oh, that's cool. So um what about that kind of environment uh, seems to you to activate uh, sort of like the leading edge of art and music and, and the combination of the two? Yeah, actually, when I was living in San Francisco, so I moved from Cincinnati to San Francisco. Um, and I think it was really important for me to be in San Francisco because my doctorate had kind of beaten me down a bit. I had... Um, some professors uh, at Cincinnati who did not believe that what I did was music. Um, my, I did this giant opera that I thought was my thesis, um, and I got told because uh, it was so collaborative that they couldn't figure out what my part was in it, so it couldn't be my thesis. And I'm just like, I sold out three nights at the Contemporary Arts Center. I got profiled by Apple. I worked for two years bringing a team together. I dictated the form of everything and let people go and do things on their own. Like I had eight channels of audio that were controlled by a motion sensor. Right. Um, and I didn't want to write those eight tracks myself. I wanted each one to have a really distinct voice. But I told people, these are the kind of samples that I want to have. This is when it's day. This is when it's night. This is how crazy they should sound. And so I got eight very, very distinct soundtracks. But the faculty could not wrap their heads around the fact that that was me composing um, and sort of like Xenakis, I'll put the structure in and then the stochastic um, cloud particles will fill in the details. Right. Um, so uh, <coughs> San Francisco was really important for me because everyone there was so accepting and positive. Um, but I'm glad that I moved back to New York where they're like, Oh, I saw that you did that a month ago. What, what have you done since? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> It's an incredible push, isn't it? It's crazy. And I'm somewhat grateful that I did not um, go to school in New York either and that I was sort of able to come back and be formed and be um, new and competent. <laughs> Do you think that there's a sense that in, in the New York like performing environment that it also it almost like preferences people that go away for a while and then come back in so that you're not like the person I see, you know, at the corner store and now I see you performing and Luke and Todd have been there forever. So that's, there's, I think 
it's hard to be the person that goes there for your um, maybe your doctorate only and then stay. But if you were there sort of from the beginning. Right, for the long run. Yeah. Sure. Um, so speaking of what's new this month, is there anything that you've seen lately that uh, you find particularly exciting? Uh, gosh, like in... I mean, it's not music, but I went to see the the James Terrell exhibit at the Guggenheim, and it blew my mind and made me hear sound. And I was just like, I want to put sound in there, and I'm really, really excited about the um, the MoMA show on um, sound art. And uh, I'm gonna get a backstage tour because, um, oddly, my husband who works with X rays is doing something for MoMA and they're grateful and they're like, whenever you want a backstage tour, let us know. And I was like, I want a backstage tour once the sound art show comes up. So no kidding. Um, very excited about that. And yeah, should be good. Excellent. Meg, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Is there anything, any last words you want to toss out there? No, it would always be like something cheesy, like do what you love. <laughs> Well, okay, we'll put we'll use that as the tagline then. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much and uh have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. So there you go. Questions asked, answers received. That was a very very interesting interview and it was really great to get a chance to kind of reconnect with Meg. Please do me a favor and uh, check in with the podcast. Uh, we're going to try and get something, get at least one interview done every week from here out. Um, already have a couple in the bucket. There's some really good stuff coming up. Um, I hope you're enjoying this. If you happen to want to be interviewed or if you know somebody that ought to be interviewed or if you just have any comments or questions about the podcast, please please feel free to drop me an email at your convenience. You can find the address on the website for the podcasts, or you can just hit me directly at ddg at cycling74.com. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time.